the Holy Gospel for this first Sunday of Advent. It's from the Gospel of Mark, the 13th chapter, beginning with the 24th verse. Jesus says, In those days, after the suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and put forth leaves, you know the summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a person going on a journey when they leave their home and put their slaves in charge, each with their work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else they may find you asleep when they come suddenly. What I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The Gospel of the Lord. Hi, my name is Dave brower -Riki. I work with Lutheran Disaster Response in Region 1 as our Disaster Preparedness Program Coordinator. It's great to be with you this morning. I'm up in a cabin in Welch's, Oregon, um, getting ready for Christmas, thinking how normalizing it feels to do a religious ritual that actually belongs at home. I mean, a lot of us, because we're not attending church together, are doing church things in our home on Zoom, and, and that's a gift. But this feels like every Advent. To, to, to decorate and to light the first Advent candle is just a gift. And so I'm just sitting here uh, watching the flame flicker and, and thinking about um, what a glorious time of year it is. The Gospel lesson we just read, of course, um, doesn't want to cooperate with that spirit. As the disaster guy, you know, you read about the, the sun and the moon not giving their light and the stars falling from the sky, and you're thinking, oh my goodness, and you're talking about disaster. If even, if even one little piece of one star wipes out all the dinosaurs, uh, what would this mean to have all the stars fall from the sky? But as I thought about that, I realized that that perspective comes to me because I have a 20th, 21st century cosmology in my mind. And to have the stars fall from the sky, to me, would mean just the collapse of the universe. And how could anybody um, survive that? So I want you to think with me about what that might have meant to those who heard Jesus say this. And I want to go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 1, because that's where we learn about why the sun and the moon and the stars are there. So in Genesis chapter 1, we, meet, we read, In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while the wind from God swept over the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. You know, that light, that great gift of God that, that started, and the light that's uh, rejoiced about in Christmas through John chapter 1, right? Um, that light has nothing to do with the sun, the moon, and the stars. It is a, a transcendent understanding. It is the gift of notice and grace. So what we read in Genesis chapter 1 is that the world was just an utter chaos, which is symbolized by the roaring seas and darkness. And God says, let's look. 
let's care, let's notice, let's think about what we might do. So God says, let there be light, and there is light, and it's good. That's the first day of creation. And then wonderfully, the second day of creation, God says, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters. Let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, separating the waters that are above from the waters that are below. We can see the dome when you look up in the sky. We call it the sky, right? And the dome, for, for ancient peoples, that dome, as we read in Genesis 1, keeps the chaos and the darkness of this cosmic ocean away from us. And in creating the dome, God creates a space, a sanctuary, a place for life to flourish. It's interesting to me that in Genesis chapter 7, verse 11, when we read about Noah and the flood, what is said is that after Noah and his family and the animals are safely on the ark, God opens the windows in the dome. God opens the windows in the firmament and the chaos comes rushing back in to the sanctuary God had created and life is destroyed, all but destroyed. So it is, it is this dome, this sanctuary, that scripturally is our safety and our shield. On the third day of creation, right, what does God create? God creates the dry land and, and pushes the chaos and the seas to the periphery of our life. So not only do we have space to live in, but now a place to be. And from that earth comes vegetation and trees and ferns and flowers and apples and all sorts of wonderful things. And still, no sun or moon or stars. So it is the fourth day of creation when God says, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years and it was so. God says, let there be lights in the dome and let them be for signs and for seasons. That's different. That's different. And the word for lights is really lantern. So you get this wonderful picture, which is great at Christmas time, of decorating the dome, right? It's putting these little twinkly, sparking lights hanging from the dome uh, that we might celebrate and have fun and, and be in a joyful mood. That's what God does. God decorates the dome. God decorates the firmament with twinkling lights. So they're called stars. And larger lights, sun and moon, which, which help us know when to go to bed, when to plant our crops, when to put on suntan lotion, I mean, those sorts of things. I don't want to minimize the gift of those things, but they are not, in the mindset of biblical people, what they are for me. So, in our text today for Advent 1, when Jesus says, there will be signs in the heaven, the sun and the moon will not give their light, it will be dark, and the stars will fall, we have a little bit of a mess on our hands, but the dome, the firmament, stands. And the sanctuary is secure. And within that space that God has created and still protects, even in the darkness, the angels now descend with Jesus to gather us up from the places where we have run and hidden from the margins of life and brings us back together. Rather than chaos, my image now is intermission at a show. Between the acts, when we go out, spread around the building, and then they blink the lights, and the ushers call us back for the second act. That's how I understand this text. And Jesus even says, think of other signs, think of the fig tree, what does that mean? You see this happening and you respond. Now when the lights blink, when the stars fall, when there's darkness and the angels come and say, okay, come back now. That is an invitation, an invitation to the second act, to the ongoing drama of God and God's people. So as we start this Advent season and we light one candle, as we push the darkness back, remembering how God pushes the chaos back, as we let this light gather us back to the joy and the gift of Jesus, as we let the light grow 
and see the people of God gather again. Let us wait for the curtain to rise on the second act and see the glory of God sweep over the face of the earth through your words, your actions, your hopes, your prayers, your compassion, and your concern. Oh Lord, what a morning when the stars begin to fall.